The Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Please be seated. Grace to you and peace from God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Scripture plays different parts in each of our lives, um, and it also plays different parts at different moments in each of our lives. And so there are those moments of life where Scripture is uh, kind of meant to just be getting into our life. So in those early stages of faith, in the faith formation years, the Sunday school years, the confirmation years, so much of our energy is put in getting to know these stories, to just understand how the story of Scripture unfolds, how uh, one thing leads to another, what God is doing in the world, what Christ has done in the world and is doing still. In that moment, we're just, you know, trying to get the sense of what Scripture is all about, to sort of get the storyline, A, B, C, D, all of it starting at the very beginning of creation and then coming together at the resurrection and unfolding from there. But there are other ways that we use Scripture, too. One of them is maybe for our own personal devotional life. Maybe each morning there's a passage that we read, or uh, sometime during the day there's a story from Scripture that pops into our mind. A psalm, for instance, might pop into our mind, or maybe a story from the Gospels that we know particularly well, whether it's a story of Jesus feeding the 5,000, whether it's a story from earlier in Scripture with Jonah and the whale. Whatever it is, it brings us into some sort of conversation with Scripture, and it helps us remember that we're a part of this grand story. Sometimes we look to Scripture for comfort in times of pain, in times of suffering, in times of hopelessness. And sometimes we use Scripture right here in our worship. Hosanna is Scripture. Alleluia is Scripture. It's not only in the reading of the readings each Sunday morning, each Saturday evening when we hear Scripture. It's also in the acclamation before the gospel story. It's in the blessing before the communion meal. The idea is that this scripture becomes a part of our life and grows and changes within us so that wherever we walk around, whatever we do, whatever we say, becomes an expression of this grand story and becomes a part of what Christ is doing in the world. Scripture also has another function, and that function is to challenge us. And that's one of the things that happens in this gospel story today. It challenges the people who hear it. Not in the part that we read, but in a part that comes a little bit later. It also challenges those people in the first reading in Nehemiah when Ezra is reading in the square for so long. As uh, Pastor Catherine was reading that section, you might remember that all of the people of Israel, after, reading, or after hearing Ezra read all morning, were actually not feeling wonderfully fulfilled or great after Ezra read the scripture. <laughs> there was weeping. <laughs> there was sadness. Because that scripture challenged them to see where they fit into this long story, and it challenged them to see how they could uh, further let that story unfold. When Jesus preaches to the people, when Jesus reads, uh, opens up, uh, well, he doesn't open it, he unrolls it, it was a scroll, unrolls the Isaiah scroll in the synagogue, he reads this passage from Isaiah that says that uh, he has been anointed to bring good news to proclaim the release of the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed 
go free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. These are grand things, right? These are inspirational things. These are the kind of things that you could organize a church year or a youth group retreat or a whole series of adult learning things around. I mean, these are the sort of bread and butter kind of calls of what the church is meant to do. Proclaim the Lord's favor. Proclaim release of the captive to do the recovery of sight to the blind, letting oppressed go free. This isn't stuff that anybody would argue about. This isn't anything that anyone would hear Jesus say and say, well, I'm not really sure that that's what we should be doing. It's obvious. It's obvious that that's what the church is called to do. It's obvious that that's what the people of God are enlisted to do. And so, this is the part that wasn't in the gospel reading today. Afterward, everybody says, yeah, this is wonderful. I love this guy. This guy is great. He's telling us exactly what we need to do. Finally, we're getting back to the business of what faith is supposed to be all about. And everybody is just super excited and super energized. They're just ready to go. They're ready to rock. And so, they go around and they say, oh, well, we got to do this, and we got to do this, and we got to do this. And then, and then, here's the point where they get the little challenge. Because in all of their excitement, they're making these grand plans for how they're going to let the story of God unfold in, the, in their lives and in the lives of their neighbors. And then Jesus shoots back, well, when in the last however many hundred years did you actually feed a hungry person? And when in the last hundred or so years did you actually go to a leper and help them be healed? When in the last hundred or two hundred or however many hundreds of years that you have been doing this faith thing, as you say, have you actually done a single one of those things? And, he, and you have to imagine him like pointing at everybody in the crowd. When is it that you proclaimed release of the captives? When was it that you let the oppressed go free? When was it, date, time, appointment in the calendar, did you actually go and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor? This is the point where nobody liked to hear Jesus talking anymore. <laughs> and sure enough, they felt just as convicted as you or I feel when you read this passage, and just as convicted as you or I feel when you hear this call. Because it's one of those calls that Jesus have to each of us, that it isn't one of those things that makes us feel better, isn't necessarily one of those things that brings comfort and hope. It's one of those things that reminds us who we are and how far we yet have to go. It's one of those things that makes you wonder how much more scripture you should really read because you're not sure how much more challenging you can take. It's one of those things where Jesus takes our sort of joyful expectation expectation to be told that all is well and all is right and all is good and flips it. It reminds us that we have a part to play in that story as well. The story just gets worse from there. They actually uh, take Jesus and they sort of grab him by the arms and they jostle him around and they actually take him to the pinnacle of this mountain in Nazareth and they're about to throw the guy off. This is the first time Jesus is preached, by the way. He uh, was baptized just a few weeks earlier. He was thrown into the wilderness, 40 days with the desert, and he sort of comes hobbling out of the wilderness. I imagine he's dirty. I imagine he's hungry. He goes back to his mother's house. He gets some milk. He gets some rest. Shows up at church the next morning. Somebody says, oh, you were just baptized. Why don't you, why don't you just get up and, and read for us and, and do a little preaching? And sure enough, Jesus gets up there, and nobody knows him as Jesus yet. He's just, you know, Jesus from the neighborhood. He's just Jesus who they had always known, Jesus who maybe helped them build their houses, Jesus that they may have gotten in trouble with when they were younger. Jesus gets up there, the Jesus that they think is, uh, that they expect, the Jesus that they think they understand, the Jesus that they think they can control, the Jesus that can't possibly surprise them. Jesus gets up and reads and challenges them, and immediately they realize that this is not what they want. This is not what they're interested in. This is not the Jesus that they thought they knew, and this is not a Jesus that they necessarily want to know either, because this guy is different than the guy that they know. This guy is going to call them out. This guy is going to get right in front of their face and tell them who they are. Sometimes honesty is terrifying. Sometimes the truth is scary. 
So they grab him by the arm, and they take him to the mountaintop, and they're about to fling him off. Scripture doesn't get into too much detail about how he got away, as it turns out. It says that he essentially got away. And you can add your own movie version of that <laughs> in your head. But I think it calls us to consider something about who Jesus is and what Jesus is calling us to do. Because if the first thing out of Jesus' mouth when he gets in front of his friends and his family and his community is that we have to be anointed, that we have to proclaim release of the captives and restore sight to the blind, that we are the ones who let the oppressed go free and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and we aren't doing it now, if that's the first thing that Jesus says in his preaching and the thing that Jesus tries to get us to understand all throughout his preaching, what does Jesus have to say to us too? And don't get me wrong, Jesus is still there in comfort. Don't get me wrong, Jesus is still sort of right here at your elbow every time that you think that uh, Jesus isn't around or that God isn't calling you. Jesus is still right here next to you all the time. And every story that you've ever read about lambs being collected, every story that you've ever read about Jesus weeping because his friend died, every story you've ever read about Jesus multiplying bread and multiplying loaves and multiplying love is true and is real. But a part of Jesus' love and a part of Jesus' grace and a part of Jesus' hope for each and every single one of us is to knock us out of this expectation that we've got it all figured out and that we know exactly how to do what we're being called to do and to challenge us to open up a little bit more, challenge us to maybe feel a little bit convicted and challenge us to turn ourselves around again, point ourselves toward God and maybe let go of what we think we're going to do and see what God is going to have us do. There aren't a lot of preachers who are as brave as Jesus. <laughs> because this, this passage is preached all around the country today in, in churches that do follow the lectionary, and so there, there are pastors all around not trying to be thrown off the mountaintop today, all over the country. <laughs> there are countless pastors trying not to be thrown off a cliff today. And I'll admit I'm one of them. But I'll also say, that I think that each of us have to be brave enough to claim the gospel in a way that we're all a little bit afraid to be thrown off a cliff. We all of us have to recognize this call of Jesus, this call that might give you shivers, this call that might scare you, to imagine what it would be like to stand up for the release of the captives and to stand up for the recovery of sight of the blind to stand up for this good news that has transformed each of us and to go into the world and say it so loudly that it might get a little bit rough for us. Because that's what Jesus came into this world to do and to be. That's what Jesus calls each of us to be a part of. And that's what it means to be a body of Christ. That's what it means for all of us to be a part of that body. Pastor Catherine was reading, and it's that long passage where Paul really belabors the point of trying to point out how each of us are a part of the body, and each of us are necessary, and each of us are important. And that scripture is true because what it's connected to is how each of us is called, and each of us is claimed, and each of us are taken into that space where the gospel is unrolled and the prophet is read, each of us are meant to read that passage. Each of us are meant to proclaim that this has been fulfilled in your hearing. And each of us is meant to go that step further that's a little bit scary and nerve-wracking. Called to go that little step further that we can't make sense of and don't know the end point of the story of. But still, we're called to be there where Christ is. To run up to the mountaintop with him somehow get away <laughs> and then proclaim the release of the captives and the good news over and over and over again because jesus has 
been anointed to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim the release of the captives, to bring recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And so have we. Amen.